G'day. I'd like to let you know that Aussie Med Ed is sponsored by Tigo. For most doctors, indemnity insurance is one of their biggest costs of practice. While many doctors are still with the same insurer they joined in medical school, many have made the switch to Tigo and benefited from it. The team at Tigo have told me that those new to private practice could qualify for four years of discounted premiums. To find out more about Tigo, visit tigo.com.au. That's T-E-G-O.com.au. Good day and welcome to the Aussie Med Ed, the Australian Medical Education Podcast, where we get to interview specialists in a variety of medical areas, asking their opinion on their certain conditions and obtaining their insight into how they diagnose and treat that condition. In these COVID times, it's a way of replacing the relaxed discussion around the hospital by allowing the listener to put forward questions to be answered or addressed on their behalf. I hope you enjoy the whole program. Welcome once again to Aussie Med Ed. We start the new year 2021 with cardiology. In particular, talking about atrial fibrillation, we speak to Dr. Cameron Singleton, who has expertise in cardiac electrophysiological procedures, including cardiac ablation and insertion of cardiac rhythm devices. And we look forward to hearing his approach to the assessment of a patient with atrial fibrillation and the treatment options involved. Not only will this information be useful for the general practitioner seeing a patient on a regular basis, but also for the medical student revising for their exams or preparing for their OSCE examination. I'm Gavin Nyman, an orthopedic surgeon based in Adelaide and also a senior lecturer at the University of Adelaide involved in orthopaedic musculoskeletal teaching. I hope you enjoy the podcast series, and if so, please feel free to subscribe, give us a like or review, or tell your friends about it. We look forward to having you listen to our podcast series, and we hope you find it enjoyable. I'd like to begin this podcast by acknowledging the the traditional custodians of the land on which this podcast has been produced, and pay my respects to the elders both past and present. Now, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Cameron Singleton a graduate of the University of Adelaide who specialised in cardiology and held fellowship position at the Royal Prince Alfred Hospital specialising in cardiac electrophysiological procedures. He specialises in cardiac electrophysiological procedures including catheter ablations as well as insertion of cardiac rhythm devices and resynchronisation procedures. He practised both at the Flinders Medical Centre as well as privately at the Calvary Adelaide Hospital, at the Ashford Hospital as well as Mount Barker and Strathalbyn Peripheral Clinics. It's a great pleasure to have Cameron on. Well, welcome Cameron Singleton. It's great to have you on Aussie Med Ed. We're going to talk to you about atrial fibrillation. Also, we've chosen atrial fibrillation to talk about because it's the most common arrhythmia. It'd be excellent if we could start off by defining what types of arrhythmias there are and if we could categorise them or how you classify them. Right, okay. All right. Well, thanks for the invitation, Gavin. Well, in terms of arrhythmias, we normally think in terms of supraventricular and ventricular. So supraventricular, anything above the ventricles, obviously, so that's atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, atrial tachycardia, SVT. Technically, any uh, arrhythmia above the ventricles is an SVT, but the term tends to be reserved more for reentry circuit SVT, such as we see with Will Parkinson right or atrioventricular node reentry. So that's the full gamut of that sort of arrhythmia. And then there's the ventricular arrhythmias. And we basically think of these in terms of ventricular tachycardia occurring in the context of a structurally normal heart and ventricular arrhythmias occurring in the context of structurally abnormal heart, such as prior mild cardiac infarction or cardiomyopathy of some sort. Okay, so that's a general classification. Am I right in thinking atrial fibrillation is the most common one? There's no, no doubt about that. The most common arrhythmia in our community is atrial fibrillation, yeah. And how would they present? Yeah, so the presentation of atrial fibrillation is very varied. It's thought that it occurs to about 1% of 40-year-olds, but maybe 10% of 80-year-olds. So it's certainly more common as we get older, but it also goes with a lot of other conditions. Obviously, the well-known ones are hypothyroidism will make you prone to atrial fibrillation. Increasingly appreciated is that sleep apnea will make people prone to atrial fibrillation. Alcohol excess is another well-known condition or toxic metabolic situation that can predispose people to atrial fibrillation. We think of them in terms of paroxysmal, episodes that come and go, persistent, episodes that last and need a drug for termination or a DC shock, long-term persistent or permanent where we basically accepted that atrial fibrillation can't be terminated and the person will be perpetually in atrial fibrillation. Presentations, anything from rapid Irregular palpitations that make people feel awful with chest pain and out of breath, feeling lousy and about to die, pre up to no symptoms at all. And we sometimes see people coming in with no symptoms at all, going along at 130 beats per minute in atrial fibrillation, totally unaware of it. Is the advent of the Fitbits and the Apple Watch and things increase the presentation of these arrhythmias? Are people more aware of it because of it? People are certainly 
paying attention to their watches. In my own anecdotal experience, I'm not convinced that it's actually throwing up more cases, to be honest. We're certainly seeing more worried well who pay attention to what their phone says. I'm not sure if it's turned up any more true atrial fibrillation cases, but that's just anecdotal. I don't know what the evidence is on that. That's just my own personal experience. What's the complications of atrial fibrillation? Yeah, so the dreaded complication really is thromboembolism. And this has been appreciated a lot more in recent years. And in fact, a lot of work's been done on classifying stroke risk. Uh, we have the chads vas system, which helps us do a ready, quick estimate of someone's thromboembolic stroke risk based on risk factors such as history of congestive heart failure, hypertension, age, you know, increasing age risk factor, diabetes, uh, history of stroke or TIA and vascular disease. And unfortunately, women are more at risk of stroke than men, so the female gender counts as a point on that stroke risk system. So absolutely mm, urgent to sort out what a person's stroke risk is and make a decision about whether they need anticoagulation or not. And we generally would say score of two or above on the CHADS VASC, you need anticoagulation unless you have a problem that you know rules you out from anticoagulation. And that would generally be a history of serious GI bleeding or, uh, or serious cerebral bleeding. Even in that subset, we look at left atrial appendage closure device, but that's a whole lot topic and a bit more sophisticated. That's, that's key. We can get people decompensating into heart failure from their atrial fibrillation can precipitate ischemia with chest pain and even non ST elevation myocardial infarctions are not uncommonly seen in people presenting with atrial fibrillation due to the rapid rate, inefficient uh, cardiac function resulting in poor perfusion and some ischemia. And also syncope. Now syncope, atrial fibrillation itself rarely causes syncope. But there is a situation where when people with paroxysmal fever, persistent fever, their episode terminates, you can get a post-reversion pause which can be quite prolonged and result in syncope. So the atrial fibrillation itself hasn't caused a syncope. It's the, uh, it's the per, uh, pause upon termination. And those people often will end up needing a pacemaker. That's the most common person. The presentation, of course, depends on their comorbidity. So someone who has a very stiff ventricle with what we call diastolic dysfunction, so classically a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patient, has a very stiff ventricle, so diastolic dysfunction. If they lose atrial contraction due to atrial fibrillation, they'll often be quite symptomatic. They'll get quite breathless and heart failure because they depend on atrial contraction to push into a stiff ventricle. Whereas if you've got your 40-year-old healthy individual who's just drunk too much beer, of course it's uh, the Australia Day long weekend, and got atrial fibrillation, you know, they're probably not going to go into heart failure. So the, I think the key is there's a big range of presentations. Very important to to first of all deal with the immediate problem, I guess, is their angina, is their heart failure, you know, is the person decompensating? That's an immediate medical priority. But in the longer term, the priority is to make sure you've appropriately assessed and triaged the person from a stroke risk point of view. One question that comes to mind, obviously, as an orthopedic surgeon, is is the actual incidence of a thromboembolic event for the patient who actually stopped the anticoagulation for a small period of time. Obviously, the most classic patient of ours would be someone who's a bit overweight, maybe had a history of a bit of heart failure and it may be diabetic or type 2 and they've got some atrial fibrillation. What is the actual risk of stopping the anticoagulation perhaps for five or six days? I'd like to let you know that Aussie MedEd is supported by HealthShare. HealthShare is a digital health company that provides solutions for patients, GPs and specialists across Australia. Two of HealthShare's core products are Better Consult, a pre-consultation questionnaire that allows GPs to know a patient's agenda before the consult begins with the aim to reduce admin and free up time during a consult, and HealthShare's Specialist Referral Directory, a specialist and allied health directory integrated into GP practice management software, helping GPs find the right specialist. You can find out more from healthshare.com.au. Yeah, well, I guess a couple of things. First of all, I do come across patients who advise to stop their, you know, their NOAC five or six days before surgery, and this is really not necessary because they they they're gone within four to eight hours. So, you know, perhaps three days before a major operation would be reasonable, but there is no need to stop at five or six days. That's simply lengthening a period without anticoagulation for for no real reason. Uh, so keep it uh, no longer than is necessary. So this would be the first point, and I would say uh, 72 hours for no eight patients is ample. 
then what we do is you look at the Chad's VAS score. So if their Chad's VAS score is 2, their annual stroke risk is about 2.2% without anticoagulation. If their Chad's VAS score is 6, I think it comes out at about you know, 5 or 6% per year. So if you say, well, that's 52 weeks. So if I've got someone who's got a Chad's VAS score of 2, right, they're 65 and they've got hypertension. So one point for hypertension, one point for being 65. And their annual stroke risk with anticoagulation is 2%, roughly 2%, right? Now, 52 weeks, if you divide that by 50, that's point, I don't mean to do the maths, but I think it's 0.04% per week. And we're saying we're going to stop this stuff for less than half a week. So the chance of that person having a stroke is 0.002 in that three days. So so I think you can have a, so that's that's the value of this trans- chance of score because it gives you an idea what their annual stroke risk is. And then you can say, well, this person's got a chance of score of six. Their annual stroke risk is 6%. The stopping their anticoagulation may not be great. Maybe this is someone I should bridge with Plexane, right? Whereas this other person, their chance of score is two. Their stroke risk is 2% for the whole year. And I'm going to stop this stuff for three days. So what's that? Three out of 365. It's less than 1%. So their stroke risk is going to be 0.02 or something for those couple of days. So they don't need bridging clexane. So in other words, look at the patient at their overall risk. One keep the time that you, that you hold anticoagulation to something scientifically proven, two to three days, not six days. And secondly, look at the patient and see what their overall stroke risk is. A lot of them be relatively low and they can be quite okay without bridging clexane for three days. And of course, for those listening, the disclaimer, obviously each patient needs to be considered separately and assessed by their GP or their cardiologist in that scenario. Uh, moving on, are there any other types of scales apart from the Chad Vass score? Are there other ones that you use as well or is that the, the one to know? Oh, I use that mostly. I mean, I think there's, there's the Hasbled which looks at their bleeding risk. I, I must say, I don't use that on day-to-day assessment very often, but the concepts are still there, and that is what's their renal function like, how elderly are they, how frail are they, how skinny are they, all these sorts of things. Of course, we make a decision about people who might be prone to falls. So if someone's a falls risk, that has to be factored in to the decisions about anticoagulation. In other words, there are, you can't really protocolise management of atrial fibrillation. You have to look at the patient as a whole and make some judgment calls but based on those working principles we've been discussing. For the medical student listening, you see a patient presents with acute atrial fibrillation. What other things must you consider in working them up, apart from the obvious cause of the chronic nature? Is it Could there be acute elements that, or events that could have happened, and what, what would be the screening you'd do? Yeah, well, I mean, we always want to know if they'd be drinking too much. Uh, again, you have to look at the person as a whole, but we're, we're interested to know... Toxic things, so alcohol excess, uh, are they thyrotoxic? Do they have sleep apnea? Is this part and parcel of some other cardiac conditions? Do they have cardiomyopathy? Do they have coronary artery disease? So, you know, all those other general cardiac history elements that you would take from any patient, particularly, would apply in the, in the AF patient as well. And what about the role of actually assessing for a heart attack, uh, looking for troponins and doing e- serial ECG? We do troponins in these people and ECGs as well. Uh, you, you sometimes get a, 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 a troponin elevation purely as a consequence of the, the rapid ventricular rate from the AF, not due to any coronary atherosclerosis. It's, I mean, often you have a situation, someone might have moderate coronary disease that doesn't normally cause them any symptoms, unbeknownst to them and any other, anybody else for that matter, and they turn up the heart rate of 170 from their AF and they get a bit ischemic from it and have a bit of a troponin leak. That's very common. If someone's coming along with an anterior infarct with a STEMI, fibrillation infarct, LAD occlusion, and they have an AF as well, I would hope that people would not miss the ST elevation on the ECG. So obviously, basic standard protocols of assessing cardiac patients with history examination, the ECG would apply. So if someone's got an acute coronary syndrome, well, that will be obvious on the ECG generally. Obviously, that person will generally complain of angina-type symptoms or chest pain, you know, ischemic-type symptoms. Most of the patients I see with AF are not in the context of acute infarct, and that's working in big uh, public hospital and a number of fairly big private hospitals. The AF is generally not part of an acute ischemic syndrome. It's, uh, or if it is, they're, they're going to the cath lab to have their artery opened urgently, and often if that happens and you reperfuse the person, their AF spontaneously terminates within 24 hours anyway. So, but of course, you must consider the acute ischemia as a, as a driver of AF, but the overwhelming burden of AF out there in the community is not that patient. It's the chronic fibrillator or the paroxysmal fibrillator associated with hypertension, sleep apnea, alcohol excess, thyrotoxicosis, or underlying sort of cardiac condition, or sometimes just lone AF. You know, we certainly get lone AF. You know, people who have AF and you can't find 
any other associated cardiovascular cause for that. That exists. I think I, the terms of calling people alone, if something it depends how hard you look. If you look hard enough, you often find something, you know, hypertension or you've got some quite thin, skinny people who end up having severe sleep apnea and that's driving their AF. So, but line AF does exist. People turn up with AF and you can't find why. No, no, no other associated condition. Do see that. So the treatment path of uh, treating the atrial fibrillation, I presume you'd go down both an anticoagulation path as well as a try and correct the atrial fibrillation mode. Is that correct? Correct. So, so whenever any atrial fibrillation patient that you come across, there's always the decision tree, which is rate control or rhythm control. So in other words, are we going to try and restore sinus rhythm in this person and do whatever it takes to restore sinus rhythm, and that's called rhythm control? Or are we going to say, no, we're going to accept the atrial fibrillation and do rate control? Now, both patient groups will often need anticoagulation, but that's often the first decision point. I mean, you're going to anticoagulate pretty much every AF patient you meet acutely Really. The people we don't anticoagulate are the CHAD0, CHAD1 patients who you've got no intention of cardioverting. So you don't meet too many of those in the emergency department or in the GP's rooms. I guess you might get someone who is a paroxysmal fibrillator, gets palpitations on and off, they're mostly in sinus rhythm, but you or somebody else has done a halter and it shows paroxysmal fib, episodes of fibrillation lasting a couple of hours at a time, their CHAD score is 0 or 1, you're not going to anticoagulate them. That's a subset. But everybody else, you're probably going to anticoagulate because the CHAD score is going to be two. And the interesting thing is, even if you can restore sinus rhythm in someone with a CHAD score of two or higher, you're still going to anticoagulate that person because the, the stroke risk is considered to still exist sinus rhythm or not. Unless their AF is part of an acute medical problem, such as post bypass AF. So we do get people who've never had AF in their whole life have a bypass, and then day three of the bypass, get AF. Last for 72 hours, they go to sinus rhythm. Those people got AF purely as a consequence of the surgery with the inflammation and so on of the heart being handled and operated on. And if they've never had AF before, if they've only got post-operative AF, then we don't consider they need to be anticoagulated long-term. They, they've had AF as a single self-limiting episode part of some intercurrent medical problem. So that's a good subset to bear in mind if you've got some correctable medical problem that's given you AF and you correct that medical problem, you don't necessarily need to think of that person as an AF patient forevermore. So anyway, back to the patient group, the common ones that we see, yes, you want to get acutely, you want to get rate control and you want to anticoagulate them. If they're compromised with chest pain, heart failure, really uncomfortable, you'll probably want to get them into sinus rhythm and so we can do DC cardioversion for that or pharmacologic cardioversion for that. But you have to be sure there's no thrombus in the heart. So how do you know that? Well, Personally, if someone's been in AF more than about six hours, I'm not prepared to do a DC shock without knowing they're, they've got no clot there. So in the current era, we can do a transesophageal echocardiogram in most hospitals, relatively easy to get hold of on the day in the bigger hospitals. And once there's no thrombus seen on transesophageal echocardiogram, you can roll on and cardiovert on the same day. So this is very commonly done in the big hospitals now. If person turns up with AF, you keep them fasted, you do the toe, there's no clot, you go on and cardiovert them, they can potentially be discharged on the same day because we can't assume that someone's not got clot there. They might do. The alternative is if someone is stable and you see them in the GP practice and they're a new diagnosis of AF and a little bit puffed, a little bit tired, but they're okay, that patient group you can anticoagulate for four weeks and then do the DC cardioversion without the need of a toe. So you must have four weeks of therapeutic anticoagulation before a cardioversion or no evidence of thrombus on TOE for a cardioversion. So you have to factor that in and how you manage your patients. And what's the anticoagulant you tend to use or you'd recommend nowadays? Well, I'm using a Pixaban pretty much all the time now, 5 milligrams BD for people with GFRs above 60 and between 25 and 60 GFR, a 2.5 BD, under 25 GFR, can't use the NOAX in its warfarin. Fortunately, there are not that many people out there with a GFR under 25 in our practice. So most of them you can manage with no acts, which is so much easier for the patient than warfarin. The cardioversions you use, I know there's options of biphasic versus monophasic. Uh, perhaps you can just, quick, just briefly describe those type of cardioversions and what the difference is. Yeah, I wouldn't be too fussed about that. I think most defibrillators are now biphasic. I don't think there's too many monophasic defibrillators out there anymore. And they're just a more effective uh, waveform for cardioversion. So you don't have to worry too much about that. Just um, get them to dial them up to 200 joules and deliver the shock. Must be synchronised though, when you cardiovert someone, 
you've got to synchronize the shock. If you don't synchronize the defibrillator and you deliver a shock, you may be shocking on the vulnerable part of the cardiac cycle and shocking on the T wave, which could precipitate ventricular fibrillation. So, you know, when you do a cardioversion, select your joules. I always go with 200 joules. I don't see any sense in mucking around with 50. Just go straight to 200 and almost always gets people out. But make sure synchronize has been selected so the shock is synchronized to the QRS and T wave appropriately. Why would you even bother this well if you've got ventricular fibrillation? patient, you don't want to synchronize. You've got to be able to wear this option. Ventricular fibrillation, don't sync to that. The fibrillator will never see a QRS, will never deliver a shock. So you have to be able to deliver an unsynchronized shock in that situation. But for all our organized rhythms, fibrillation, flutter, SVT, organized VT, they've always got to be synchronized. Okay, sorry to go on about that, but that's a very important point. No, that's good. That's, that's what we want to hear. More important whether it's monophasic or biphasic is whether you select synchronized or not. If we go on to the pharmacological versions of uh, treatment for atrial fibrillation, what are the main ones you use then? Is the digoxin still in favour? <laughs> I don't use digoxin at all. So if you're looking at rate control, then you use an AV node blocking drug. And beta blocker uh, or a calcium channel blocker is, is perfectly fine. If you're looking at antirhythmic drug, then you have to make a decision based on the patient. So people with structurally abnormal hearts, really the only antithetic drug I would use would be amiodarone. Uh, people do use subtle on that situation, but I think it's often disappointing uh, not, and not without potential for problems. Structurally normal hearts, so and a lot of our AF patients are structurally normal hearts other than a little bit of atrial dilation. So normal ventricles, flecainide is quite a good drug for those people, both IV and for chronic management orally. But you can't give that drug unless you know they've got a good left ventricle. And also you want to be very careful if their conduction system is not normal with bundle branch block, etc. I wouldn't use it in that situation because being a sodium channel blocker, not great to give sodium channel blockers to people whose hispokinsy system, which is a sodium channel system, is not, not, not normal. So flecainide, good drug for people with good LVs and normal conduction system, and that's a large percentage of our AF patient group. Amiodarone's fine, but uh, I can't imagine you want to give someone who's 50 amiodarone for the rest of their lives. But it can be quite a very useful drug acutely, and a lot of the time we're just managing these people acutely and then reassessing how we manage them in the longer term. So just because you give someone amiodarone acutely or for the first week in hospital doesn't mean you're necessarily going to use that as long-term treatment for somebody. And I guess that brings us to the next option, really, is catheter ablation. So we, we do a lot of catheter ablation for atrial fibrillation patients because the drug options are not perfect, not great, are not well, they're, they're mixed. Um, and there are plenty of patients who prefer a catheter ablation rather than indefinite treatment with drugs that have potential problems. Right, and what does that actually involve? Does that actually require an anaesthetic or is it done under sedation? Catheter ablation for atrial fibrillation is uh, the cornerstone for that type of case is, um, is pulmonary vein isolation. So this is where, with some energy source, in Australia still mostly radio frequency current, although quite a lot of sensors using cryo, so freeze, we uh, get rid of the electrical activity from the pulmonary veins where they join onto the left atrium. That's a procedure that in paroxysmal fibrillators done by people with good experience in, in the cases should get an 80% or better result for patients. If you get into persistent and long-term atrial fibrillation, success rates drop off to more like 50 to 70% success rates for that sort of procedure. So that pulmonary vein junction to the heart is actually a main cause of... The area for setting off AF, yeah. and that was shown very nicely by the Hasseguer, a French uh, uh, cardiologist, probably mid-90s, did the seminal work on this. And I don't know if anyone still even knows why, <laughs> why it works. But pulmonary vein isolation does a good job for many people, with particularly paroxysmal fib. And the experienced hands and, and sensors that do a lot of this work, it's a very low-risk procedure now. Certainly an option for people who can only hold sinus rhythm with amiodarone, for example. You know, nice way to get them off amiodarone to do the ablation. Or people may be holding sinus rhythm on flecainide, but don't want to be taking drugs at all. So it's certainly in our management armory these days is catheterization for atrial fibrillation. And is that why sleep apnea is, is associated with atrial fibrillation because of the dilation of the pulmonary veins in that? In no way am I an expert in sleep apnea. But, but as I understand it, people desaturate their oxygen content, their high CO2, they get atrial stretch, they get autonomic arousal. We're talking about this 50 times an hour, every hour, every night, right? So I think if you were designing an experimental uh, model with animals for atrial fibrillation, 
you'd probably want to, oh, I reckon I'd want hypoxia, I reckon I'd want acidosis, I want CO2 content, I want atrial stretch, I want autonomic activation, I'd want all these things to get my animal to go to AF. Well, that's what sleep apnea is. So it's only surprising that it leads into, into AF. And there's quite good data that optimal treatment of sleep apnea decreases atrial fibrillation and also losing weight. It's been shown to help with minimise further problems with atrial fibrillation. Is that because of fat content in the heart wall or is that because of the sleep apnea association? No, it's not that. Uh, you, you probably need to speak to somebody else about the actual theory behind why weight loss decreases AF. I mean, it seems to decrease AF independent of sleep apnea, that's my understanding. So we, we want our patients who have AF to approach things from all directions, right? If they're drinking too much, you want to cut how much alcohol they drink or abstain. If they're overweight, we'd like them to lose weight. If they've got untreated sleep apnea, we'd like them to treat that. So, so these are all things that we can do in parallel with appropriate medical therapy and in a selected subset a procedural approach, you know, ablation approach. Well, look, this is brilliant. I really appreciate the information provided today. Excellent rounded subject on atrial fibrillation. It's been great having you on, on today on Aussie Med Ed and uh, first first interview for the whole year. Thank you very much, Cameron. All oh, right. No worries. You're welcome, You're welcome Kat. Okay. The information provided to you today is designed to complement the information provided to you in your local region and should supplement your readings and teachings in that area. Please don't take it as the only way of treating this condition or assessing a condition but really is one of, one of various ways of assessing these conditions. Please be also be aware that the information provided today is really just general medical advice and isn't designed to actually be a source of medical information regarding your particular condition. Remember to consult your specialist or medical practitioner if you have concerns about a condition raised in this podcast. Well, thanks once again for listening to our podcast, Aussie Med Ed or the Australian Medical Education Podcast really enjoy hosting this podcast. I hope you find it useful to hear a pragmatic approach to everyday conditions. If you have any questions or information you want to ask about us or you'd like to put a suggestion for a topic, please don't hesitate to email us at gavin at med-ed.com.au. Once again, I hope you've enjoyed listening to it and we look forward to hosting it next fortnight when we introduce a new topic. Thank you. Aussie Med Ed is proudly sponsored by HealthShare, a digital health company that provides solutions for patients, GPs and specialists across Australia. And Tego, offering medical indemnity insurance for doctors. That's tego.com.au.